Welcome, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be in front of you again. And uh, we're going to be talking about the uh, use of electronic schooling or introduction to electronic schooling. And uh, I'd like to start with the uh, electronic schooling. Just get you familiar with what the concept is. It's a, uh, it's a big menace for us as we, as we come across a variety of applications. And uh, uh, if you don't manage it from a thermal standpoint, whether it's your uh, iPhone or, or Samsung phone or whatever phone that you're using, to some sophisticated electronics like a, a multi a multi channel uh, uh, computer center that that does a lot of sophisticated computing, uh, it all requires thermal management. The reality of it is, when we look at the application, the heat uh, kills irrespective of the uh, market sector. You know, you can see examples of a windmill catching on fire. This is the inverter that's caught on fire as a result of the overheat. Uh, you can see examples of a PC that is on fire, uh, laptop, even a drone that, that's in flight, uh, it, it gets caught on fire. We've seen examples of the laptops, uh, computers, hard disks, uh, even the uh, electrical boxes that we deal with because of the excess heat that's uh, created, not being able to cool effectively catches on fire. And fire is obviously a threat and also it, it shuts down the, uh, the functionality that we're looking for. So if not managed, heat is a, is a fire threat and is a, is a showstopper for us and we have to do very diligent work in order to make sure that it's done and it's done effectively. So when you look at the electronics, uh, where is the source of heat? Where is it coming from? What, what is it that we have to do in order to be able to uh, mitigate it? Uh, the, it starts with the chip, irrespective of the, of the component that you're using, whether it's a, a IGBT, a power device, or, or a CPU, GPU, there is a, there is a, there is a chip there that is generating uh, uh, functionality that we're looking for, and that chip is nothing like a but a very very small micro-sized uh, PCB, uh, very flat, very uh, uh, small profiles, and uh, very difficult to manage from the time to time, depending upon the uh, heat distribution of the chip itself. Because we cannot make an assumption that the chip has got a uniform power. As I mentioned, it's very much like a PCB, as PCB has different uh, power distribution and, and uh, hotspots, the chip does the same thing. And uh, this is the area that the problem starts. This chip is packaged into a variety of packaging that's available in the market. And there's like, I don't know, 50 different uh, packages available. And uh, this creates a functionality that eventually goes into onto a board. And uh, as a result of passing current into the uh, device, these are materials that are not perfect. They have current leakage and as a result of it generate heat. And the heat, as you can see, is dispersed quite a bit. Uh, uh, so not only the chip itself is affected, but also the devices around it are affected as a result of the conduction convection that we have. Uh, so we have a new, huge constraint uh, when it comes to electronics packaging in order to be able to remove the heat. As uh, thermal and mechanical engineers, we are the last uh, link on the, on the food chain and it is very, very important that for us to be able to be creative, come up with uh, unique solutions, because oftentimes we don't get involved at the onset of the design. We are given the, uh, the uh, uh, final product that we have to cool with very limited ability to be able to move the heat around uh, once its uh, circuit is put together. So you can see uh, from the chip all the way to the package and eventually the system, that's where the menace is. That's where our focus has to be when we go through electronics uh, cooling. So uh, what is the packaging hierarchy that, that takes place? So sometimes people call it the C4. Uh, you start at the chip, where the chip is placed onto a, onto a chip carrier, and then uh, a, a component is produced as a result of it. And again, there are a variety of components in the electronics market. That, that you've seen many, many examples of it. Typically, in most applications, this uh, component uh, that carries the chip is placed onto a PCB, and that's a printed circuit board. The, uh, the stuff that we have in the green material that's in the background is printed wiring board. So when we put the components on it, it's called a PCB. And then this uh, single PCB uh, could be an engine by itself, or oftentimes it's put together like a, a telecom chassis or rack that you see, and then creates a particular functionality. Like what we see here is a system that provides uh, video streaming for the uh, uh, for the datacom market. And oftentimes these uh, racks and chassis 
are put together into a system that creates a bigger picture as far as uh, deliverability is concerned. Imagine you want to feed a city or a block or whatever uh, for a variety of uh, calculations or, or the delivery of data. Or we can, we can see a lot of examples in the data centers or uh, central offices of devices like this. And even more recently on the, on the uh, uh, biological uh, computing that, that requires a lot of, of these uh, uh, boards uh, to be put together in order to provide the function that's required. So you can see the hierarchy of the packaging that goes through from the uh, package all the way up to the system. And this is where it goes into the uh, customer premise. This is where the eventual system is residing. I'm bringing this up, I want you to sort of bear in mind uh, when we talk about the system. So when we come to thermal analysis, you see what, what the hierarchy is and so forth. So the packaging hierarchy is in this direction, and we're gonna see how the thermal analysis is. Now it is important to, to uh, notice how the heat is generated and what happens when this heat is, uh, uh, what, what happens when it goes. We, we talked about a uh, component going onto a, onto a board and rack and then eventually into a, into a cabinet. The, the heat is, is, is here on, on that chip that you saw a couple of slides ago. And that's where a lot of the heat is generated. And this heat is conducted, whatever the functionality of it is that, that pushes the, uh, the bits uh, uh, into the network and so forth, the wasted, the wasted heat is conducted uh, through the package and eventually convected and radiated off everywhere. It's a highly three-dimensional heat transfer. And uh, we have to, again, pay, the, pay attention to the importance of it, as you're going to see uh, in, a, in a short uh, slide or two. So this uh, the component goes onto a PCB. This PCB goes into a, a bunch of uh, racks and eventually into a system, as you can see here. And this heat that is now coupled together now we have airflow or liquid cooling through this, depending upon what your cooling application is. Doesn't make any difference. The advantage of a liquid cooling is uh, you pick it up and, and dump it elsewhere. Now you have to deal with that dump elsewhere. Uh, air cooling tends to be more local, and, and there are a variety of designs to be able to take this heat away from the uh, uh, rack or a, or a bay into the uh, given environment. And eventually goes into a system, and these cabinets are deployed across. But again, there's a high degree of coupling that takes place within the system now. If, if I'm generating heat in this location, and depending on the path of airflow and the design I've done for my, for my system, I could be heating devices that are located here. The heat that's being absorbed, for instance, from the chassis, if it's an outside cabinet or it is residing right next to another cabinet, the radiation coupling that takes place or convection coupling that takes place uh, between the two uh, could potentially cause a problem. So uh, the understanding of the heat and its sources and the level of coupling that takes place is very important. Another very important uh, uh, point to note, a lot of us as engineers have a, have a habit and tendency of looking for a like solutions in the in the uh, uh, our daily engineering tasks and say, okay, you know, so and so solved this problem in, in such a fashion. So if, if uh, he was dissipating, uh, 45 watts on a tiny little board in natural convection, I can do the same thing. Not the case. The reality of it is the design is as different as the designs designers who made it. The materials that are used in electronics uh, packaging is so different. It is very much manufacturers dependent. The fundamental materials may be the same, but when they put it into a composition, especially dealing with a lot of polymers, the material properties are very unique to the manufacturing process that are taking place. As a result of it, the data is not transportable. Meaning, if I was able to cool a device, a small, tiny little board in natural convection of 45 watts, that doesn't mean you can do it. However, the procedure that I took, or the process that I took to solve the problem is very much transportable. If I understand the uh, solution path, not the actual number or actual data, if I understand the solution path, I can take that solution path and apply it to my problem. And that makes my life a little bit easier. I, I can learn from my colleagues that who've solved this problem before I did. But my word of caution to you is don't make an assumption because of the fact that some article, some web page, or whatever you've seen, a given answer to a problem, that's a universal solution. It, it, it's very, very difficult in a problem that's multifaceted like this to come up with a silver bullet. Uh, you see a lot of companies out there, you see a lot of products and solutions out there, and they, they, they think they have solved the world's problem. 
but in reality, it's really a very specific to a, a particular class of problems. So, word of caution: as we have a nasty habit as engineers to look for the for the quickest solution and get the answer because we're under pressure to deliver a lot. But uh, understand this: understand the solution procedure, then the data becomes clear. So what is the uh, what what do we mean or what's what's thermal management? Why do we need this? What what what's a big deal? Uh, there there are two issues that we have to really worry about. One is the uh, functional integrity. The other one is the operational reliability. We know the semiconductor device uh, performance may drop with the increase of the operating temperature. Hence, maintaining a low temperature will yield satisfactory function. What does that mean? Is a long sentence, a simple sentence says, uh, if I can put uh, you know, 10 uh, bits into a, into the pipeline, if I cool it down to the level that is uh, operationally not, not uh, disadvantageous, I can maybe put 100. So I, I can gain efficiency on functional integrity without creating any kind of error. And as the temperature goes up, I can create bit errors. Uh, and a simple example, for instance, let's say uh, I take a picture of your chest as x-ray picture. But the doctor may, most likely is not sitting at, uh, at the hospital, is either at home or a different state, especially with today's electronics and so forth. If I have electronics problem, I can put impressions, I can put dots on, on, on your, on your uh, uh, x-ray. This is manifestation of the electronic problem because of the temperature as one of the causal agents. And so the interpretation of the doctor is, is different. Or you transfer money from one bank account to another bank account. You want to send a thousand? The electronics sent 10,000 of your money to another account. These are the kind of functional errors that we can see, are called so-called the bit errors, that could cause a lot of functionality. We've seen hiccups in our communication, for instance. We get we get choppiness and so forth. Not that's all from thermal, but thermal could be one of the causal agents uh, for this uh, for this process. The other one is operational reliability. Uh, you, you saw the pictures that I showed you uh, on the uh, on the uh, wire bonds and so forth that we have on the chips. Uh, this is, if you remember, like a circuit breaker or a fuse. Uh, if the temperature gets to a certain level, the thermal stresses are so much, that's going to cause mechanical failure. Uh, there's going to be disruption in the line that is uh, carrying the signal. And this disruption could be at the micro level, so your chip is broken and it doesn't work anymore, or to potentially shut off some of the, some of the uh, uh, circuit flows uh, and uh, not, not deliver the function that we require. As a result of it, you've had a hiccup in your system or, or a catastrophic failure. So in order to prevent these two uh, elements, there's a very simple rule that we have to follow. If you don't take anything else with you uh, as a result of this presentation and take one item, is the thermal management from my perspective, others may disagree with me, its sole focus is junction temperature of the device. For most uh, silicon, this number has evolved to be about 125 degrees C for any ambient. It has to be less than or equal 125. We typically, when we go through the design, because of the complexity that I mentioned with the multiple material properties, uh, with the packaging issues, manufacturing processes, etc., etc., we typically leave about the 10% margin on this. So we don't call the design complete unless I have a 10 or 15 degree uh, difference uh, to 125. So if my junction temperature calculation for the worst possible operating ambient is 110, 112, I, I cautiously call that design complete and go forward. So my sole purpose of thermal management, it's a focal point of junction temperature. When you look at the literature, when you look at the uh, manufacturer's data, et cetera, et cetera, they, they're making reference to this, this device is an 85 degree device. And that's a very, from my perspective, uh, humble perspective, is a very, very erroneous data to communicate to the to the field because uh, in the laboratory I can create in a control situation 85 degree approach ambient temperature uh, of the fluid with the air or liquid to that device. In the real world, when I'm dealing with uh, this kind of a complexity, it is very, very, very difficult. And you're going to see examples of it why I mentioned this. Very difficult to really accurately measure what the approach temp temperature is and whether 85 degree makes sense or not. But junction temperature is a very referenceable temperature. It is the, from the uh, engineering standpoint, it is the uh, hottest point that I measure on this device. 
but in a more device designer standpoint are these tiny little wires. The hardest part on these, the interlayer, metallic interlayers, is the one that creates the junction that we have to manage and then reduce. In some devices, uh, depending upon the packaging and so forth and the power density, uh, we could have devices that are in excess, excess of, uh, could be in excess of a couple of thousand degrees C. Very, very hot and it could melt very quickly because I have a very small area with a lot of current going through it. So it heats up just by the nature of the physics. So uh, if I walk away from this uh, conversation and discussion with uh, junction temperature being my criterion for successful thermal design, I think our mission has been accomplished in this, in this webinar. So uh, the goals of thermal management are, are very, very clear. It is uh, the TJ, uh, which is the junction temperature, in, in order to prevent catastrophic failure, has to be less than, less than fail. Uh, and the T spec is 125. These are all, I, I've written absolute temperature here, but this is in reference to the uh, worst possible operating ambient. So if I'm working, for instance, with a telecom, a datacom application, uh, it's about 55 degrees C. If I'm de dealing with uh, uh, consumer electronics, it's typically 30, 35. If I'm dealing with uh, data centers and so forth, it used to be uh, uh, 25 degrees. Now it's in the neighborhood of 35 because they can't really cool it effectively, <coughs> etc. Another important parameter is the desired operating temperature. When we go through the design, we want to be approximately at the mean time between failure. Again, this is for this is a delta. If you imagine your head is a delta T, not absolute temperatures, because the reference is always to the worst possible ambient. It should be about 90% uh, time of the T spec or around 115 degrees C for most silicon. If you go to power supply, some power supplies, you can push it up to 185. If you go to some power devices, there are upwards of 200, depending upon the device. And then we want, also want to do performance optimization, meaning at, at any time and any location, the, temp, the delta T between junction to, uh, to ambient is less than or equal to delta T of mean time between failure. So this it gives us the optimization because of the fact, whether we like it or not, uh, the temperature distribution as well as air velocity distribution in electronics uh, equipment is very temporal and very spatial. Uh, it depends upon where you are. Even in, uh, from a uh, car to car spacing in front of a component, if you traverse your probe from the uh, close to the edge of the bottom board all the way to the top, you see a significant temperature gradient to the tune of maybe 15, 20 degrees. The notion of a uniform slug flow and a uniform temperature is, 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 a, is, is a fallacy that we don't see. It's good for a pipe flow, it's good for a duct flow, not when we have these uh, 3D protrusions coming into the, into the uh, channel and causing the flow to stir and, and do all kinds of funky things as you're going to see. So what does thermal management entail? Uh, the objective, as I mentioned, is to maintain the junction temperature below uh, the, the uh, certain limit for the given class of devices for the worst possible ambient. So the hierarchy of modeling Remember I told you, remember that system and the way the packaging was done, we went from the component all the way to the system. We want to go from the environment where the system resides. This, this defines the, the boundary condition that we have to deal with, like the ambient temperature. Imagine, for instance, you, you have de developed this uh, security camera that goes into the southern uh, states in the country and is going to be in a, in a blazing sun in, in July or, or, or uh, August. Uh, with a high degree of humidity, uh, that's going to impact heat transfer. So you need to, that's the environment, that the boundary condition that you have to set. Then you go to your cabinet where the electronics are housed and you, you calculate the, uh, for instance, the sun loading in the example that I gave. Uh, if I have a cabinet that's sitting in the sun uh, with all the treatments that I can do with respect to uh, uh, with the reflective paint and, and uh, uh, you know, shielding and stuff like this, it's very, very difficult. Uh, it's never impossible, but it's difficult and costly to minimize radiation absorption. And as a sort of a, a, a simplistic rule of thumb, if I'm dissipating 100 watts in my box, typically I expect to get another 80 to 100 watts of sun loading in my system as a result. So all of a sudden the boundary condition is different and I have to, I have to be able to account for that. Then uh, I, I got to go to board where the, uh, the components are housed, then the component itself, the component packaging, 
and then walk, walk my way down to the chip. This is where the junction resides. So the thermal management is just the opposite of the packaging. You go from the outside, from where the boundary condition is, all the way to the junction temperature. You never start here because th this is ambiguous. And the other th the thing that we have to remember, the reason we are doing this is the level of coupling that takes place. Remember in these slides, I mentioned uh, several times, um, uh, please pay attention to the way these are coupled with each other. That's why these arrows, the red arrows are showing that how the system is coupled together in order to be able to, uh, uh, the, the, just the nature of the packaging causes, causes it to be like this. So for me to calculate the junction temperature of this device, I have to start from here, work my way all the way back and calculate the junction because the boundary condition here, the, 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 whatever is transpiring here is gonna impact this as a result of the heat transfer in and out of the system. So uh, the utility, utility of the solution level, why we, uh, when we go through the thermal modeling and thermal management, the environment gives us the boundary conditions of pressure and temperature around the system. The cabinet is the interface to the environment. It's the balance of energy. That's where I want to put my control volume and do the balance of energy so I can solve the, solve the problem. Board is a boundary condition with pressure, velocity, and temperature. And that's, again, we want to put our boundary condition around there or control volume around there in order to be able to solve the component level. At the component is the interface to the board and the uh, coolant. Again, that's the location for the energy balance. Once I put an energy balance on this, uh, you're going to get the junction temperature. In the subsequent uh, um, webinars that we're going to have, as we've shown in the past, we're going to show how the, uh, this concept of uh, integral modeling works very effectively for us to develop a governing equation for the junction temperature of the device that we're working with. So the hierarchy is from the system to the, to the cage, to the board, to the component, eventually to the die for calculation of the junction temperature. And that's how these systems, are, these areas are utilized in order to be able to accurately predict this. Again, um, accurate prediction of the junction temperature is, is critical. Uh, in most entities, uh, there is a, uh, there are a bunch of mechanical, a few mechanical engineers who are doing thermal work. There are a few engineers who are doing reliability analysis, and there's a whole bunch of electrical and software engineers. So uh, the data that we provide typically goes up the food chain, meaning uh, we come up with the junction temperature. We said the system will go or no go. And then uh, the reliability engineers pick that information up and calculate the life, expected life of that system. In some of the bigger systems that they expected to be uh, in, in the market for a long time, seven, eight years, the reliability calculation and expected life is of paramount importance uh, because you have to design a system that lasts for a long time. In the past, when, we, uh, when I was in Bell Labs and we were designing the telecom and datacom cabinets, you had to design for 15 to 30 years, depending on the application. So it was important, of, of highest importance, to be able to calculate the junction temperature so our reliability engineers could calculate the expected life. And they, if the expected life didn't meet the requirement of, say, seven years, 15 years, 30 years, X years, whatever the number is, doesn't matter. The design has to be reconsidered. So the information that you convey uh, could have a, uh, long consequence effect as far as product introduction, uh, the cost of the product, et cetera, et cetera. So it cannot be taken lightly. I wished the folks who, who, who are managing the electronics companies would have a better appreciation of how important thermal is and how cost saving can be, can be if we do this upfront. A lot of this work can be done upfront when the system is in the conceptual stage. So we don't have to go all the way to the system layout and then realize that the system is not going to function effectively, and we have to go and redo it all over again. So we understand the hierarchy, I hope, uh, that why it's important to go from the environment to the chip, and uh, the role that every single level plays in order to come up with a junction temperature. More accurate I am with my description going down the ladder, uh, more accurate my junction temperature calculation will be as, as a consequence of it, the cost of the product, the cost of the, the development, and so forth is going to be reduced. So let's just uh, take a look at every single aspect of these. Uh, we started with the component. We've drawn a, uh, just for the sake of the, the description, and more of a uh, <coughs> traditional or old fashioned uh, uh, gold lake type of component. These are the leads where the, where the circuit comes in. Typically, there's a, some sort of a packaging of molded package or whatever. The chip is bonded to the chip carrier, whether it's on the top or bottom. 
whether it's a BGA or, or attachment or whatever, this doesn't make any difference. The heat is generated here. It goes every which way. Take this picture as the heat that you generate here. Whatever is consumed for the for the functionality of the device to pass electrons uh, to to the next level, whatever is leaking out of, out of this out of your circuit, it goes every which way. Don't make an assumption that you know that's not going to go from the top or I've read in such and such in a given package, nothing is going to happen. Once that heat is leaving the system by radiation convection and then by conduction to the board, the board becomes an integral part of your the, the printed wiring board with the different layers of co uh, uh, copper. Some have uh, vias and so forth. It becomes in important and integral part of your cooling solution. And it has to be paid very close attention to. You saw a picture earlier on that heat from the device was actually by conduction heating the neighbors. So my thermal management, uh, I cannot ignore what happens in the board in order to be able to provide a successful solution. So some of the points to note, multi-heat uh, heat transfer path. I should have put a heat transfer here. High level of interconnection, uh, it is source to sink. And this actually, if I understand it properly, I can use the board, for instance, as, as a very effective heat sink. I incur the cost once, put some layers of copper in there, I reduce the temperature. In a lot of applications, for instance, 50-60% uh, of the heat that's generated in the device actually gets conducted into the board. Uh, highly three-dimensional and large level of uh, heat spreading, and and that this is also very very important when you come to the calculation uh, as how the how well the heat is spread and how the local components are affected. So we have to pay attention to that. Then when we come to the board level, it's it's a it's a interesting phenomenon because in most air cooling application uh, that we we come across with, it's probably is eighty percent of the market is air cooled, maybe even higher. Uh, th there is uh, these protrusions uh, that are, are into the channel. Typically, we have one or two or three or X boards on top of each other. The flow comes from one side to the other side. And we have these Manhattan-like topology that is taking place that causes a huge, huge havoc for us. Um, we do a lot of uh, water flow simulation to understand what the board layout is and how the flow is being distributed. Uh, some of the videos that we've done, I'll show you some pictures. They are just uh, breathtaking because I've never seen before these flow structures that uh, that exist in the in a, in a circuit board. So conduction coupling via the printer wiring board is huge. If if I'm pumping a lot of heat into the board, I could be heating my next door neighbor, uh, next door component. If I'm again heating a lot, I could also, depending upon the air velocity and the surface condition and so forth, I could be radiating a lot of heat to my ne neighboring component. Uh, typically, radiation after about two meters per second is a smaller portion, but in natural convection, radiation heat transfer could account for up to 25, 30 percent of the overall uh, thermal transport that's occurring in the, in the device. So, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, I'll show you that. Uh, uh, convection uh, coupling is, is, is huge, meaning uh, some of you might, for instance, have seen convection ovens, uh, they say the check-in cooks much faster. The reason for it is you're getting hot air that's wrapping around the check-in or the roast uh, in, a, in a higher speed. And as a result of it, uh, the heat transfer is significantly larger. Well, we have the same roasting effect here. If I have a very hot, hot device and air is coming through here, this air gets heated. And this low power device that I pay no attention to had only one or two watts. I, it was not part of the consideration. But because of the packaging being downstream of this hot device, I'm actually cooking it. So we thought this device was dissipating two watts, but now it's dissipating five watts. And either airflow management is required, <clears throat> or uh, uh, we, we have to come up with a heat sink or some other cooling solution for this. So, and at the same time, as I mentioned, I cannot ignore radiation coupling. It's something that, as mechanical engineers, uh, not that much emphasis was put on the uh, radiation. Everybody thinks that radiation happens at the sun surface temperature. Uh, no, radiation happens as long as you have a delta T, we have heat transfer. All three modes of heat transfer persist at a given delta T. Now, the magnitude of it is obviously a function of the condition that we're dealing with. The magnitude may be small, but it's never zero. So in your, in your uh, layout and setup, radiation heat transfer could be very significant that we have to account for. Here are some, some uh, flow visualization stuff that we've done that is just uh, mind-boggling. This is a standard PCB 
where uh, uh, the flow is coming from the uh, top to bottom. You see, uh, this is at the 150.75 meters per second, a digital board, and we are visualizing the flow with uh, two color ink. You can see that the flow that's introduced here, it's accumulated here. The flow that's introduced here, it's coming back down into here. Well, guess what? These devices are coupled via, con via convection. So all this air, which is shown in blue, is accumulating and coming down here as it's moving down and then circulating slowly here, it's picking up all the heat that's being generated by these devices. So this device number 20 gets cooked as a result of the convection coupling. Look what's happening here. These are not a manifestation of uh, poor photography. These are the hot, uh, the, the fluids from two different locations are actually merging together and coming down the pike here. So there is a lot of inter, uh, interaction taking place. Look at the uh, effect of uh, the flow. The, you think that these devices are uh, getting uh, uh, adequate cooling. You would expect, you look at it and say, oh, there's, there's nothing wrong with this. Uh, there's a passage here that the flow is going to come in and device number 18 is going to get cooled effectively. Well, look what happened. As a result of the board layout, the flow comes in here, it breaks to the left, and then goes out here, Fol follows the least resistance path. And as a result of it, these devices are not getting any cooling. This is getting partial cooling, number 17, but number 18 and, and uh, 13 is not getting the, the cooling that's required. Look at these optical modules. They're coming in and they're, they're, they're shooting out, and as a result of it, the power supply is getting very little to no flow. This is the one that's most fascinating. Had I not put the arrow here, you would have, <clears throat> you would have thought the flow is coming from left to right. But in reality, the flow is coming from uh, right to left. This is a component. The height is twice as this, and there are three components in line. And look what has happened here. This component has created a three stagnation points, and it is creating these horseshoe vortices that are going around the device. The flow that's accumulated between the two devices is cir circulating and coming back out and going out this way. So the heat that's generated here is going back to this device, is heating this device, it's creating a stagnation point here. And when I was talking about, you know, when they say 85 degree at uh, device temperature, well, where, where am I going to measure this 85 degree C? If I get a thermocouple and traverse it from top to bottom, I see a significant temperature gradient across this. And as a result of it, I have no idea what the temperature reference was that the uh, device manufacturer designed it. That's why we focus on junction temperature. When we have this kind of a soup that we're dealing with, and it's a hodgepodge of stuff, I have to go to a point of reference that I can measure and act ad adequately uh, control and, and hopefully manage, and uh, you, see, you can see why we are talking about the junction temperature. So you can see a highly coupled system, and this is the message that we want to take, have you take away with you, with you that it, it is very, very important to pay attention to the level of coupling that takes place. So uh, let's look at the uh, uh, electronics thermal transport and the traditional problems that relates to electronics, obviously cooling. So the thermal coupling is primary mode of coupling is, is by convection heat transfer. And we have a system like this, and if you have a critical device that resides here and the flow comes in. And remember, the air is, is very smart, or the, or the fluid, I should say, is very smart. It's going to look at from a, a mile away. It's going to find out what the least resistance path is and go through it. It's an incompressible fluid. It's going to identify the lowest resistance path, and it's going to go through it. So it is upon us as engineers to make sure that we have a uh, system that we understand the flow distribution. Otherwise, we have to deal with this. Other non-critical components may have an adverse response as a result of the thermal coupling that takes place. This is the biggest menace. Part of the reason that uh, us as thermal engineers are in business is because of the fact uh, these problems are so complex to solve. Otherwise, if it was a, like a traditional classical problems that we saw in our heat transfer and fluid mechanics courses, our uh, elect electronics uh, engineer uh, brothers and sisters would have been able to solve the problem without any issues. So a combination of the convection and conduction thermal coupling may enhance component level thermal uh, communication via the back plane and car cage, so we have to be uh, cognizant of that. So what are the steps for successful design? Uh, Hopefully, uh, this would make sense to you as, as you look at your process in your company. 
establish a specific Tamar requirement. Uh, sometimes the military, military does that very effectively. I know that some of the Japanese companies in the old time, they, they, they used to do this. They would come back, for instance, say, temperature in no place of the system. Any component, any board, anything can exceed 100 degrees C. What this does, uh, as long as it's reasonable, it gives us a point of reference to compare and, 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 and work towards. So uh, I, I don't have an ambiguous anymore 85 degree component or junction that I can't measure. Uh, hopefully I can measure and, and, and manage it effectively, but this gives us a ground zero. Employee system level approach. Aim for two solutions starting with that integral model. What are we talking about? Uh, because of the complexity that we saw, a lot of us have a tendency with the advent of very, very strong uh, CFT tools that are out there, and they've been verified to the kilt. But I, I can never rely upon a single solution, whether it's integral model, experimentation, or uh, CFT, to uh, say my solution is complete. I have to have two independent solutions. What, are in, what I mean by independent? Let's say I, I have me and, and Joe, and, and, and I do the CFT, and Joe goes and does the experiment or come up with the integral model and a little calculation. We sit across the table. I said, Joe, what's your answer? What's my answer? We have to be within 15% of each other. If you're not, the solution is not closed. We have to start all over again. One thing we do not want to do, we do not want to model one thing and put our data into another model and say, well, we are within 2%. No, that's not an independent solution anymore. That's a highly dependent solution because you took the data from one, you put it into other one. Completely independent. Perform thermal evaluation at all phases of the design cycle to make sure that your design is meeting requirement. Integrate different disciplines, system, electrical, physical, and reliability engineers into your, into your conversation because they're all being affected by the data that we produce as I talked about it before. So it is, it is important to, to go through these four steps in order to be able to produce uh, and, and create a, a very effective uh, 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 design uh, process. So let's go through a simple exercise. We have a purpose of the highlight of typical process of thermal design. A system shown below is, is to, to be cooled by forced convection, meaning that we have some fans or whatever inside the system that's moving the air. The vendor of the fan, uh, uh, fan shelf has provided a fan curve, determined whether the system will meet the thermal requirements, uh, meaning junction temperature, with the following information provided. Circuit power dissipation, physical geometry, tentative circuit board layout, and critical components are identified. So we have our system, we know it's gonna go every which way, and we have to go and approach it and see whether we can solve it. So some of the questions we wanna ask, we know the junction temperature is a function of air velocity and ambient temperature. This is a must, we, we, this, this, there's nothing, uh, I, I can remove the air and put fluid versus uh, air. If you're dealing with liquid cooling, no different. The problem is the same, but the application is the same. So we want to get a, a very clear picture. We want to understand the problem before we jump in there and do a CFT model or go into an integral or go into an experimental model. So system level, system application side, indoor, outdoor. Remember, we talked about the radiation coupling. System design constraints, as simple as it must be painted a particular color. For instance, a lot of the stuff that go outside, because of the fact it goes into people's uh, neighborhoods, they don't want to have something that's like a bright yellow or whatever. It has to be certain color that, that sort of filters into the, into the background. Well, every color has certain uh, solar absorptivity uh, conditions. The consistency of the paint that we use is very, very important. So we have to understand so we can, we can design the, we can uh, uh, assess for the uh, solar load. System environment and adjacent systems. If I'm going to a data center, I'm not going to put a system right next to this thing that's going to have a, a 15 kilowatts of power right next to a 1 kilowatt. I'm going to have coupling that takes place. Air filters, the characteristics, system vents and, and openings, shapes of the louvers, color, etc. cetera. Uh, card rack level, card to card spacing, EMI shielding, very, very important. And what, what's their configuration? Free air passage area. Shelf material is attachment to the, to the frame. Can I possibly use the shelf or the card cage or uh, as, a, as a heat sink and, and be able to transport the heat away. Board level, board material. You know, we got to understand what level of uh, conductivity we have. In the subsequent uh, uh, webinars, we're going to show you four, 16, 18 layer board, et cetera, what the, what the thermal conductivity is and what an important role 
uh, it plays. Possibility for local metallization of the board in order to be able to uh, uh, use it as a heat sink. Op options for component placement and uh, uh, how I can lay it out. Again, we're going to show you as, as I change the layout, uh, I, I can gain significant advantage uh, for cooling with the exact same board, exact same components, but I have to buy, buy the buy-in from the uh, uh, circuit designers because once I move the components around, the communication that has to happen between the components and the distance is of paramount importance, and I cannot randomly go and change it. So component level, package type, it is very important. You know, uh, if, I, if I spend extra $5 on the package and get a more conductive package, I don't have to worry about the heat sink. If I put the metallization in my board, I may not have to use a heat sink. So all of these things have cost implications and uh, packaging. Power dissipation fluctuations, the specific location of the critical components, power dissipation of the, of the uh, component is just into the critical component. The spacing, thermal data, specifically RJA of the critical component. I don't like these resistors, but in a pinch, they can potentially be handy to give me a warm, fuzzy feeling as to where, I, where, I, where I'm residing and what I have to do. Certainly as a junction temperature calculation, I, I advocate against it. Neighboring board uh, component power, we talked about this at the level of coupling. By obtaining answers to these questions, we should have a good picture of what the system is and, and strategize the cooling solution. So the first thing is to calculate the air velocity. We have the fan curve, we have the system curve, the point of intersection of the two gives me the air velocity uh, that it, the system is going to see as a result. But this is a bulk air velocity, not the local velocity to the component. So uh, it, it is you know, standard calculations that, that, uh, that we do in, 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 uh, in order to be able to obtain the uh, effect of the uh, system. Then we do some component level calculations. It's really important to calculate the approach air temperature. I call it the T sub A for T ambient, but this is not the T ambient here. It's the T ambient here for this component. So it's a simple uh, change of enthalpy across this channel, m dot Cp delta T, T out and T in. I can calculate the TA as a function of these two. And now uh, I, I, have, I have a sense of, okay, I, I have approach air temperature, again, bulk. This is like you put a thermocouple in here. That's what this calculation shows. If, you're, if I move the thermocouple a little bit here, a little bit there, the number is going to change. No ifs and buts about it. But I want to get an average temperature that's approaching the component. So I can get a TA. So quick quick calculation is uh, uh, I, I use the RJA based on the number that I have. Is my junction temperature satisfied? TJ minus T ambient divided by power is an ambient. The more detailed calculations and local numerical modeling that I have to do to go through this calculation. <coughs> so the quick answer is RJA, TJ minus T ambient divided by power. Again, remember, this is the T sub A. I'm using the interchangeably just to convey the same, same message divided by power. And the power that we're using is the total power that's dissipated in the device. Uh, that's another parameter that we have to be very careful with. Uh, when, I, when I go through the calculations, or when I used to go through the calculations, I'll always use the maximum possible power. If my system passes for the maximum possible power that the uh, device the manufacturer uh, specifies, then I'm safe. And the conversational question I have with uh, circuit engineers would be, would this device ever see the maximum power that's specified in the data sheet? If the answer is yes, in our design, then I'm going to use the maximum power. If not, I'm going to use the nominal power. This is a very important parameter that we have to be uh, cognizant of when we go through the calculation. So the more detailed calculation, analytical modeling, uh, we go through the, uh, uh, we get the heat transfer coefficient for the backside of the device, et cetera, et cetera. This is the uh, uh, control volume approach that uh, I call it the integral modeling. We put a control volume around the device or a system. And we specify the heat transfer coefficients. We specify the thermal conductivity. We do energy balance. Q dot in plus Q dot generated is equal to Q dot out minus Q plus accumulated. And that's where I do. Uh, we, we start from that and we, we work, work our way down. The computational model, we have to go through uh, one of the CFT packages uh, here. Uh, we, we obviously, uh, we, we have a number of CFT packages that we use here. Uh, we have Six Sigma, uh, uh, Flow Therm, uh, CF Design, and also uh, a uh, package that is based on uh, 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 name just skipping my mind right now, but it's a very very accurate uh, high level calculation. Six Sigma is a primary tool that we use. It's a very fast, uh, a good tool to use in order to be able to come up with a with a quick solution for these. 
Uh, by the way, one of the reasons uh, besides Six Sigma that we use for the variety of design applications, part of the reason that we have different tools is because of the fact uh, there are different capabilities in different CFD tools, and also different customers require different uh, uh, solution tools. And then once the uh, solution is done, we obviously have to go through the verification either with the experimentation or analytical model. So you can see it's quite a bit involved when we go through the, through the process. So irrespective of what we did, remember uh, I mentioned that we have to have a margin, the, the criteria that we use for thermal design. I call it the eta factor, that the delta Tj divided by delta T spec, this is the junction minus approach air, spec is the, what the manufacturer says, at this temperature the device goes kaput. The kaput is not that device blows up, it starts creating bit errors. A, a bit error is a point of failure that we have to minimize them and, 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 and uh, eliminate. So uh, when, when this delta T is less than or equal to 90%, the solution is complete. If it's not, we have to go back and do it. So remember, at this point, the analysis is required to calculate the fit rates. Uh, we also have to be very cognizant of the acoustic noise. Uh, acoustic noise is air condition. And also nowadays, uh, over the past well, probably 10 years, the environmental effect as far as the uh, carbon footprint is concerned is very, very important. And this is from the... Uh, concept all the way to uh, disposal. So when, when the customers are paying attention to, especially the big customers, not, not if you buy an iPhone or, or Samsung phone or whatever. Uh, if you, I'm talking about the people who are spending millions of dollars to uh, gear up for a, for a data center or, or a, some office building has to put their own data center in there. They all look at the, the full cost of ownership, which is no longer just buying the product. It is service, it is the product, and all the way down to disposal of it, which is very, very expensive these days to dispose. So you have to consider all of those in, in, in addition to the acoustic noise to make sure that the device is working properly. So in your leisure, just to do this uh, quickly, uh, to, to see whether uh, uh, that M.CP calculation and, and, and the calculation of the junction and so forth can be done very, very uh, quickly and you get a sense for it. So uh, roadmap to a solution in a few more minutes that I have. How do, how do we develop a solution for electronic schooling problems? Uh, obviously, the first one is define a problem. You saw these, uh, the pain that I went through just to convey a message uh, by putting these bullets as to, oh, come on, where is it? See, the, the, I'm sure there are more questions that we can add to this. This is, a, if you will, is a cookbook of, of, of sort for you to ask questions. What is it that we have to ask for and see what, what, what they are and what we have to do? So this also tells us the def definition of the problem. What is it that I'm dealing with? What, what kind of a problem is it? What kind of step, the steps that I have to go through? And then based on this, develop a solution based on integral model. This is the control volume conservation of energy that I, made, that I mentioned. This gives you a lot of capability to do with what if scenarios. And again, in subsequent uh, webinars, we're gonna show you, as we've done in the past, how these are done. Then we ask a very, very important and big question. Is the problem from logically understood? Why are we asking this? People have become very CFD happy. Computational fluid dynamics. They come across a problem, they, they, they model it in a CAD tool, the SolidWorks, ProE, whatever you guys are using, and then they pump it up into uh, uh, one of these CFD packages, and then uh, you push a button and start doing the simulation. Well, if the problem is not from logical understood, understood, the CFD tool is not going to be capable of. Uh, uh, Addressing this. By the way, the name of that tool was DNS, Direct Numerical Simulation that we use. It just, just came to me. I had a little bit of a senior moment as uh, Josh tried to make me as old as I am. So if the problem is from logic understood, uh, we do computational. If it's not, we do an experimental. But the core of it, the mother, is an integral modeling. So we compare the solution and make sure that the ADA factor is satisfied. If the answer is within a specific tolerance, the solution is complete. If not, we have to go back. So doing your homework up front, you don't repeat all this process all over again. And you take your step by step and walk you through it. Hopefully you can go through this as like a fluid, as straight as possible, and you come up with a complete solution. So it's a discipline of going through the problem. Whether you like it or not, uh, this is what we have to do. We come across a lot of clients uh, across the globe that they come to us when they have a problem the system is designed, they're asking us not to cool, the to cool come up with a cooling solution because the product is delayed for shipment. And as a result of it, we notice that they just did CFT or they just did measurements or they did nothing 
and now the system is failing and um, they expect us to perform miracles and, and makes our lives significantly more difficult, but keeps us in business. So uh, the roadmap, the, the, the criteria to satisfy the solution are as, as follows. The solution is developed based on engineering principles. It is trackable. The developed solution can be defended with engineering reasoning. You know, when, when you're going through this, what, what, did, what do these mean? The developed solution can be def the defended with engineering uh, reasoning. For instance, as I increase the velocity, we all know the heat transfer co coefficient becomes asymptotic. So after a certain point, I'm going to only get uh, two or three percent changes, maybe one or two percent. So if I march my solution analytically or computationally to say uh, five meters per second, I got to see my, my my temperature variations are in the one or two percent. If I see the temperature has has uh, increased or still decreasing, either I have not reached asymptotic solution or there's something wrong with the solution. So these are the kind of the, there has to be engineering judgment and uh, based on engineering principles that we know. As a matter of fact, whether you're dealing with electronic schooling or, or rocket uh, technology, as long as you're on this planet, the laws of physics apply. I don't know what happens when you go to uh, Mars or, or, or some other galaxy, but as long as you're on planet Earth, uh, the laws of physics, the laws of thermodynamics apply, and we have to abide by it and ensure that solution is correct. So product design cycle and the role of thermal model, what happens? Where, where, do we, where do we play and what, what kind of a game we have to uh, insert into the, into the full cycle? Uh, obviously, uh, in most entities, uh, input from system, electrical, software, uh, physical design, or mechanical engineers, and thermal uh, engineers. Uh, we are lucky if to be part of that conversation, but uh, certainly the, the circuit designers and system designers are the ones who do it. They conceptualize the system. At this junction, we want to do a very quick thermal analysis. I call it the first order analysis to determine whether the system design meets the expected thermal constraints. If it does, we go to the electrical prototype. At the second level, we do a thermal analysis, verify the design, computational or experimental analysis in order to do it, to make sure that the system is meeting that junction temperature requirement. I don't have to look for anything else. The junction temperature requirement is of utmost importance. Some of the applications that, that we, there's a human interface involved, the surface temperature also becomes very important. In most applications, you can't go over 60 degrees C. So your junction has to be maintained at a, at a particular level so you don't have any electronic problems. Your surface temperature has to be below 60 degrees because of the fact, the touch factor that we have. So if it passes, we go back to the system build. Once we go through the system build, the last test is a thermal evaluation. This is environmental stress testing. To verify function, uh, functional performance has it's not really nothing to do with uh, sort of per se. Some some thermal and mechanical engineers get involved in this phase, phase of testing because uh, this is really a system test at elevated temperatures in order to make sure it's working. If it passes, we ship the product. If it fails at any of these junctions, we have to go back. Hopefully, if you've done your, our homework, if we get a failure, it is not a system. It's not like this. This is this is cause for firing. If you're working at the company and you did the design. And the system failed at this level, uh, uh, I'd be I'd be hard pressed to see that you, you don't get fired. If you, you've done your homework properly at these levels and you've done the therm thermal verification, this is this should be a piece of cake. If any issue is going to be more on, more on powering, on the software, on the on the uh, circuit configuration and so forth, it should not be a thermal. So at every level, you can see the level of uh, first order uh, calculation, second order calculation system level testing that is really more environmental and this really puts the whole picture of the of the uh, thermal analysis in, in, into into uh, our design cycle so with that uh, remember that the heat kills effective thermal management of electronics is the key for the fail safe operation <coughs> irrespective of the system that you're dealing with don't look at it because I have a I have an iPhone or, or, or a Samsung phone or whatever. I don't have to worry about heat. Or if I have a windmill that generates a lot of a lot of uh, airflow, I'm not going to get on fire. You are going to get on fire. Look at the drone. Drone gets on fire. It's up in the air, moving at I don't know five ten kilometers per hour at least, if not more, and still catches on fire despite the fact that it's got significant convection cooling taking place because of the fact the packaging wasn't done right. Had the packaging been done right, uh, this wouldn't have happened. Had the heat been taken out effectively to the body of the, the drone, and then they knew that at a certain air velocity, this thing is going to get uh, cooled off. 
it would have happened. Or had they designed the body in a, such, in a fashion that uh, had adequate surface for the total power heat that's been generated, when it's in still, and even if you're, you're in altitude, the sun loading doesn't affect you, this wouldn't have happened. And I can go through the same explanation over and over for every single one of these uh, that, uh, that you can see the fires taking place. The heat is a threat. Thermal management is a key to successful design. And whoever tells you otherwise, don't believe it. So with that, I thank you. Uh, remember that ATS is here to support and help you. Uh, we are delighted that you, you have participated and uh, hope you uh, enjoyed the presentation.